Running the store on her family's hop ranch was how Beth Pervine Monroe made money for college expenses. I <coughs> ran a little store because these people didn't have any cars to get to town. Uh, they were brought to the campgrounds so often by their, their husbands or families. And as I say, they were just there on a, a little outing for a while. They would have no way to uh, get their food. So I had a little store, probably uh, maybe 10 by 12 out of rough boards with a window that would open up in the front. On many ranches, delivery trucks made regular runs from town to sell groceries to hop pickers. The working day began early. Everyone was in the field by 7 or 8 a.m. Most people wore old clothes or coveralls because hop stains were difficult to remove. Some wore hats for sun protection. Cotton or canvas gloves protected hands from the scratchy vines. In the early day pole yards, the picking began when the poles were hoisted out of the ground and lowered to rest against a support of crossed planks. In post and wire yards, the harvester picked the hops within easy reach and then hollered, wire down. At that call, the wire man came and used a pole with a hook at the end to lift down vines for stripping. A wire down pole is shown at the left of the photograph. Boxes were used in picking during the earliest days of the Willamette Valley hop industry. Later, canvas hoppers, such as those pictured here, were used. In some hop yards, bags hung from a metal framework were preferred. Later, baskets that held 50 pounds each were used. Pickers filled two baskets and shouted, weigh them up. The weigh man would then empty the hops into a sack to be weighed. The weight was entered in a book or punched on a ticket, and the picker received credit for a cent a pound or more, depending on the going rate. At the end of the day and on weekends, friendly wrestling matches, ball games, and dances filled any leisure time. The Key brothers, whose father rented a hop ranch in the Aurora area, recalled socializing in the evenings. Ming Key, pictured here on the left, describes the fun after supper. This photograph was taken by his brother, Bu. I still have that instrument, and they play, and they sing, you know, see, around the campfire, we built a huge campfire them days, you know, see, and we spend the evening until they're ready to go to bed, you know, there's a song, or stories, recitation. Rules were seldom posted. It was understood that decent behavior and clean picking were expected. Picking clean referred to picking hop cones only, avoiding leaves and stems. Yard bosses, or the growers themselves, kept an eye on the quality of the picking and would reject a basket of dirty hops. Indians had reputations as good, clean pickers. Some growers regularly recruited Indians from the Silettes Grand Ronde, and Warm Springs Reservations to harvest hops. Whole families would arrive in wagons and on horseback, and the ranches would furnish pasture in addition to the standard camping facilities. Children often accompanied their families to the field and helped with the picking. 
Sometimes they were rewarded with the pocket money they earned or with special treats. Sidney Newton of Independence recalls, That was something kids had to do to as soon as you're big enough to go to the hop garden, you can do that pretty early. I was, I was six years old, I recall. And so we'd go and pick hops, and, and uh, we got awarded, I think, that we had to pick a box and a half of hops. And uh, we got the uh, silly pop at the conclusion of the day. We made their allotment, so we could in and do that and play the rest of the time. While the amount a child could pick varied, an average adult worker could pick about 200 pounds of hops a day, receiving punches on hop tickets for the amount picked. Each farm had different tickets. This hop money could be cashed in for payment from the grower or, in some instances, spent in town. Merchants would collect the value of the tickets from the hop growers at the end of the season. After picking, sacked hops were loaded into wagons and hauled to the drying kilns. Nearly all hop growers built their own kilns to dry the hops. Distinctive ventilators, or cupolas, marked the tops of the kilns. The drying floor of a kiln was about 16 feet above ground, and sloping platforms allowed hops to be carried up and dumped on the kiln floor. The floor of the kiln was not solid, but slatted and covered with burlap. This prevented the hops from falling through while permitting the free flow of heated air from stoves located underneath the drying floor. After 18 hours or so of slow drying, the kilns were emptied by pushing the dried hops into bins with a large scoop. After cooling, the dried hops were compressed into rectangular bales, each weighing about 200 pounds. For many years, the majority of growers sold their crops a year or more before harvest to dealers or brokers who advanced money for cultivation and harvest expenses. The dealer took the crop when it was dried and paid the grower any balance due. In 1916, when Oregon's prohibition law took effect, many growers thought that the industry was doomed and they quickly cut production. In 1915, the state had 20,000 acres in hop cultivation and produced 21 million pounds of hops worth over $2 million. By 1918, Oregon had only 8,000 acres in cultivation and produced 3 million pounds of hops worth $700,000. Despite prohibition, both state and national, the industry made a steady comeback between 1918 and 1932. Throughout the 1920s, the hop industry was supported by export and specialty markets, such as near beer and illegal home brew. One minor but interesting market was for hops used as tonics and sold by prescription. These bottles, which belonged to Herman Goshi of Silverton, bore the claim that the contents gave strength and vigor in every drop. Although the onset of the Depression years marked a slight downturn in the market for hops, the repeal of Prohibition in 1933 put new life into the industry. 26,000 acres were planted to hops in 1935. This was an all-time high for the state. The hop fiesta in Independence was a reflection of good times in the industry. Every year between 1934 and the early 1940s, a queen and court were chosen to preside over grand celebrations that included carnivals, parades, and dances 